Hi, Pastor Matt. Listen, thank you for downloading or streaming this sermon. Pray that it blesses your heart. Two quick things that I wanna lay before you uh, before we get started in the proclamation of God's word. Uh, the first is, man, I, I love that you're dialing in to hear uh, what the Lord's put on our heart here at TVC, but I ask that you would only consume these messages as supplemental and in no way replacing your commitment um, and your listening to your local church pastor. Uh, th these are good gifts of God's grace for the people of God to grow in, and yet they are not to replace, ever meant to replace, our belonging to a covenant community of faith where we are. The, the second thing I wanna lay before you is, is that there are a lot of man hours that men and women here at the Village Church put behind not just the creation of this, but the creation of all kinds of resources that, that are meant to help you grow and develop as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so if this blesses you or the other resources that have been created have blessed you, would you consider giving back to the Village Church to support not just these things, but the creation of even more resources for you and really for anyone who wants to indulge in them. Now, um, I, I pray that God stirs your affections for Jesus Christ as you listen now to the proclamation of God's word. Well, good morning. How are we? Doing well? That good, huh? It's great. Um, listen, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab those. We're going to be in Psalm 150 today. Uh, I'll use some other text, but that'll be our, our primary text on the day. Before uh, we get started, I want us to spend just a moment uh, praying for uh, really the longest tenured members uh, of the Village Church. Tiff and Doreen Cothran have been members of TVC for 28 years. And across that 28 years, yeah, you can celebrate that because that's unusual. Across that 28 years, they have served in almost every capacity at our church. They served in the nursery well before it was called Little Village, and then they, uh, they served among elementary school, and then they served among youth, and then they led home groups, and then their daughter actually became one of the first children's ministers of this church, and they have just faithfully, and even as they age, Tiff is 85 now, I think Doreen is maybe a year older than that at 86, even as they age, they tried to find places in which they could serve. And so uh, for the last few years, they have been greeters. And so they have just stood at the door and smiled at you and welcomed you in. And they are a picture of a couple that has just owned this church. This is my church. And wherever I see a need, I'm going to fill that need. And they've done it for 28 years. And the reason I'm kind of laying that before you is that um, Tiff has had, in my time, he had his first heart surgery before uh, I got here, and he's had two since I have been here. And in the last one, I uh, went over to his house uh, just a few days before the surgery to pray with him and Doreen. Uh, and as we pray, there's just a lot of fear about whether his body was going to be able to hold up against this next surgery and whether or not he was going to make it out of that surgery. And man, Tiff just wanted to live to April where he could celebrate 65 years of marriage with Doreen, right? I mean, how incredible. I can't even get my head around 65 years of marriage, right? Uh, and so, man, he came through that surgery, did survive that surgery, uh, although uh, once the recovery period had, had finished, the, the level at which his heart has been able to beat uh, healthy blood through his system is really low, operating now at about 20 to 25 percent, which makes him very weak and unable uh, to operate in ways that, that he really wants to operate. Um, then about three weeks ago, in one of the more crazy, weird, like what is that kind of things. They found an infection in Tiff's shoulder that ended up being a coli. Uh, and so he was in ICU for eight, nine days in and out of consciousness. Uh, and man, on multiple occasions, they just thought uh, it was over. And so man, we've been in there and out of there praying. His wife, Doreen, uh, like I said, 86, 87 years old, has just refused to, I mean, stubborn is not the right word. I'm not sure the, the word to use where you've got this 86, 87 year old woman going, I'm not leaving. Right, well, you're frail, you need to eat. I don't care, I'm not leaving, right? Falling asleep, standing up, not leaving. And she just stood by her 
husband's side. Uh, and then finally, another, uh, another family from our church went up there and said, Doreen, you have got to get some sleep. You've got to get something to eat. We will stay here. Go home. Uh, and then Doreen got in a car. I fell asleep and got in a car accident on the way home and, and broke a part of her pelvis. And now she is in another hospital, not the same hospital as Tiff. And, and Tiff has, over the last 72 hours, started to decline rapidly. Uh, and so, man, I, I want, before we dive into the text, before we dive into uh, the, the preaching of the word this morning, to just pray for Tiff and Doreen Cothran, that, that, God, would, um, that would, God would hear Tiff's heart cry to make it to April. Right? What, what, a, what a beautiful prayer request in looking at, hey, man, I might not wake up from this. It wasn't, oh, let them you know, be with my grown children and grandchildren. It's, man, I just want to celebrate year 65, and so I want to pray over Tiff, and I want you to join me in praying over Tiff. And I know, man, if you're at one of our other campuses, this might be weird. And you're like, who's Tiff? I don't, just he's a longtime brother. So anything good here at the Village Church was wrought in some ways to Tiff and Doreen Cothran wetting the floor with their tears, asking the Spirit of God to do something at this church when this church was a uh, 100 people. I actually worked with his hands to build our very first building ever. If you've been to uh, the, the Martin building over there, that was literally built with the hands of our members, Tiff being one of those that led the charge. And so let's pray for him, uh, and then I want to begin to unpack uh, where we're going today. Father, I thank you for Tiff and Doreen Cothran. I thank you for a picture of faithfulness that spans decades, that through their highs and through their lows, their trust has been in you. We thank you for how they love this church with all the changes that have occurred in this place over 28 years. They have always owned this church. They have seen it as their church. They have seen the weaknesses of this church as opportunities to serve. So I thank you for good pictures, good models good people to look at and say, that, that's, that's a goal of mine. So we ask now, Spirit of the living God, would you touch Tiff's body in this moment? Father, will you strengthen his heart? Will you allow his heart to begin to beat with a ferocity and a rhythm that nourishes his body? Would you bring him uh, into consciousness? Heal his Body, And then we pray for our sister Doreen. We just pray that in some supernatural sense you would stabilize her, if but only to be moved to the hospital next to her husband. We pray for the emotional stress they're both feeling, being apart from one another. And we ask, we just selfishly ask, because you're a good and gracious father, that you would grant this husband and wife their 65th wedding anniversary so that we might celebrate as a body the reality that you sustain those whose hope is in you. So we ask for our brother and sister, sustain them. We thank you for their example and pray for your power. And it's for your beautiful name I pray. Amen. So I... We are a church that tends to preach through series. Uh, and so we preach through the book of Exodus or we'll take a, a topic and then we'll do 12 weeks on a, a topic. And so it's a really rare thing for me to just have a weekend that's just sitting there. It's like a standalone weekend with nothing actually planned. Uh, and so even now, um, next week is another standalone sermon. And then we move into 12 weeks on the kingdom of God where we begin to look at God's dominion, his dynasty, his dominion over the creative order. And for 12 weeks, we're just going to marvel at the kingdom of God. And then there's like this one, standalone sermon. And then during the summer, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 and look at the gifts of the Holy Spirit and how they work in the church. Not just the sign gifts, but all the gifts of the Holy Spirit and how we're to think about those and operate those. And then there'll be like a standalone. And then we'll be in the gospel of John right up until Advent. And then we'll preach through Advent. Then we'll preach through Epiphany. We'll be right back here. See what I'm saying? There's just not a lot of these kind of just sermons that allow me to kind of look out at where we are as a congregation and encourage something that I see and call it out all the more. And so the last four or five weeks have been this unique season. I know for me, where, where I'm not in a series, but I get to just kind of look at us and go, this is good. I want more of it. And so two weeks ago when we talked about what it meant to be a man, Right, that, that we aren't to give ourselves over to this machismo, I don't feel, I do, I don't have to be, nor do we have to give ourselves over to that there's no difference, we're all supposed to just love God, but we can embrace distinct masculinity in a way that does not result in inequality. 
In fact, I said then and I'll say it again. Women on our exec team, women leading out in classes, women leading out is a sign of healthy masculinity. And, and so I wanted to call that up and call that out and encourage it because I'm seeing it. And I want to see it all the more. Right. And then last week when Bo shared uh, just the testimony of the Denton campus becoming the Denton church, I wanted us to hear and be encouraged around two things. One, that roll off leads to healthy, highly contextualized gospel outposts that are doing the work of ministry in their given locations and seeing a great deal of fruit. And I also wanted you to hear the testimony of what happens when the people of a given church own the church as though it's their church and not the staff's church. You tracking with me? Those are different things. For a, a people to say, this is the staff's church, we're their guests, let them host us, is very different than what Bo was describing when he said, no, 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 we realized if the work of ministry was going to get done, it would have to be us, the people that actually did it, so that they would own the work of ministry in a unique and right way. And I wanted you to hear that. And then that leads me to this weekend, which is one more standalone where I want to encourage something and, and, and I want us to, I want to point us all the more to it. It might seem weird to you that this is a burden of mine, but let me lay it before you. This weekend, I am hopeful that we might grow in our capacity and our delight in singing songs, both to God and with one another. Right now, let me do this. Let me set my Bible over here. I'm, I'm over here. So everybody understand what's happening? Inerrant, authoritative, word of God over here. I'm just standing over here. Mistake prone, foolish, at times cocky, sometimes moronic. I'm not using any more. I'm not giving you any more than that. Um, there, there's something about singing that humanly speaking is profound and powerful. Uh, across all the domains of anthropology, social anthropology, social scientists would say that music does something to human beings physically, emotionally, and spiritually. We are a creature that needs to, loves to be around music and participate in it at some level. Now, we cannot, as Bible-believing Christians, see that merely through the lens of common grace. All right, this is a good gift given to all humankind because God is good even towards those who don't love him. We must consider that the creator God of the universe has given a gift to his people for their good and their joy and his glory. Now, God is serious about singing, and that alone should incite some curiosity in us, right? God himself sings. Zephaniah 3, that he sings over us. You know that singing is mentioned 400 times in the Bible, 50 of those as commands. Like 50 times the Bible commands the people of God to sing. Now again, I, that should create some curiosity in us, right? Like why? Because we know it's not that like, God's having a tough time and needs to be encouraged. It's not like God's like, man, this is harder than I thought. Someone say something good about me and put it to a nice melody. <laughs> like we know that this is not the God of the Bible. He's not prone to melancholy. You know, I really need, I need someone to praise me right now or I'm not sure I can finish what I started. We know that's not the God of the Bible. So, so what's happening in these 50 commands and these 400 mentions? So um, let's do this. Let's read a, a passage um, that, that I'm hoping to unpack more and more as we work our way through this sermon. Psalm 150, starting in verse 1. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the trumpet sound. Praise him with the lute and the harp. Praise him with the tambourine and dance. I know we're Baptists. I'm just going to muscle through. <laughs> Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, I, I'm just my cards on the table. Singing can oftentimes seem ancillary to me. Here's what I mean. If I'm looking out at the brokenness of our world and tell me we didn't have a front row seat to demonic evil this week in our country, right? 
Now I'm looking at that. I'm looking at poverty. I'm looking at injustice. I'm looking at broken social systems. I'm looking, and, and then I see 50 commands to sing, right? How about we get in the fight, right? Like how about we serve the least of these? How about we learn to walk in generosity? How about we learn to evangelize? Really 50 times sing? And it doesn't help that I'm not good at it. Right, that I can make a joyful noise and it is not pleasant. Here, here's, when I became a Christian, um, I, I, I became a Christian at a time in the church, specifically in the United States, that there was this tipping point happening in regards to singing. Um, here's, I'll give you brief history because it's not my point. Um, there was a revival that, that broke out in California in the 70s. I know that's hard for us Texans, but that's where it started. Uh, and it was called the Jesus Movement, right? Uh, and so a bunch of hippies caught Jesus and freaked out and started sharing the gospel. And then they planted this series of churches called the Vineyard Churches. And then all these choruses began to be written and started spreading across the United States. And so churches started to wrestle with, for the first time in hundreds of years whether or not they were going to do hymns or whether or not they were going to do choruses. And this led to the great worship wars of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Anybody get to live through those? Yeah. I mean, like you're giggling, but churches split over this. New services were born. Churches started going, our contemporary services at nine, traditionals at 1115. Right? Like I was saved in a church that actually split over this issue. What's the right thing to sing? Do we sing hymns or do we sing choruses? Do we use hymnals or do we ask my grandmother says, wall sing? <laughs> well, like what, what is it? What are we going to do? And then on top of this great debate and what, what, what I knew as big church, that there was a way that college students were beginning to interact with singing and preaching that was different than the churches they grew up in. So uh, across the universities of the United States, there sprung up these Bible studies that, that were packed with thousands of college students, and the format was something like this. Sing for an hour, loud with a lot of instruments, and then preach for 45 minutes, and then sing for another hour and a half. And it was expressive, and it was loud, and it was chorus-driven, and man, I, I found myself getting, uh, becoming a Christian right in the middle of all of this building, which is, if you look at it, a unique season in the American church where I think there was a revival going on in regards to how we think about and interact with the Bible and singing. In fact, I, I just per my confession of being terrible at this, at, at the Passion Conference in Austin in 1997, uh, I think four to 6,000 college students who so here, uh, high on zeal, low on intelligence. We're, we're, we're there, and if you're a college student, I'm not dogging you, you're just 20 something, all right? I love you, you're great, you're gonna be fine. You're just right now, you're really excited about stuff, and I love that about you, right? Um, but, but man, I'm at Passion 97, and I don't know if I was in the third heaven or not. Uh, but I was in, man. It was Sam Perry on the keys, and I was singing, I think, Shout to the Lord, or You Are My All in All by Dennis Jernigan, and I mean, I was just there. I mean, hands up, and I'm just going for it, uh, and then I, I looked up, and there was this woman, young woman in front of me, who actually was a member of the village for a while before they moved. I don't want to out her, Julie, and uh, she, uh, when I opened up my eyes, she had turned around. She was staring right at me, and, and so I made, and once she realized I could see her, she just went, Just totally quenched the spirit, right? So I fell out of the third heaven uh, and back on to normal ground. And right, so I'm saying, I'm saying all that I'm saying today, acknowledging that I don't need to be singing background vocals. And at the most, what you're going to hear me do is start the doxology until you fill in, turn off my mic and back out. It's just in my strength, not my space, not my lane. And yet 50 times in the Bible, God says, sing, you sing, you sing. And he's not doing that because he needs it. So what's happening? Let's, let's talk about that. One sentence, and then I want to prove it. There is spiritual power unleashed when the people of God sing. Let me say it again. There is spiritual power unleashed when the people of God sing. Let's talk about that. Three, three points under that sentence. Number one, uh, the power to remember and repent is unleashed when the people of God sing. Let me show you this text. This is Deuteronomy 31, 21. It's a fascinating discussion between God and Moses where God is acknowledging, 
I know my children, they're stiff-necked, they're disobedient. It's before I even get you into the land, I promise you, you're going to rebel against me. And yet I'm going to inception something in your brain and in your heart, and I'm going to put it in your children, and it's going to confront you. Let me show you this. Deuteronomy 31, 21. And when many evils and troubles have come upon you, this song shall confront them as a witness, for it will live unforgotten in the mouths of their offspring. For I know what they are inclined to do even today before I have brought them into the land that I swore to give them. So how does God plan to ambush his people in their rebellion with compassion? How does he plan to lovingly confront them with a song he puts in their heart that their kids won't be able to forget? Now, how does this practically work? Here's how I think this practically works. I think when the saints of God come together and we give ourselves over to joyful praise, those who are wayward or weak will hear our praise and be confronted with the glory of God in remembrance. So I think as the people of God gather and we joyfully sing, people who are wayward or weak will hear our praise, see the words that we are singing, and remember and be confronted. And this is one of the ways God loves his people. This is unleashed when the people of God sing. Now, I, although we're using the word confronted here because that's the word in the text, I also think that you'll see singing comfort the people of God. Uh, many of you have experienced this. Some of you have experienced this. Many of you have heard about this. Um, but it is not uncommon for older men and women who uh, are struggling with Alzheimer's or dementia to hear amazing grace, hear just as I am, hear a hymn or a song from yesteryear and return with clarity for a few moments. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but a shell of a man or a woman, a man or a woman who can no longer recognize their children, don't really remember where they are, and is a hollowed out version of what they once were, will hear Amazing Grace played on the piano, and they will enter back in, and they will sing words, and they will be present for a moment that they weren't before the hymn was played. This is power unleashed remembering in a way that either confronts or comforts, and it's what singing does. The second thing here, not only uh, when I'm talking about spiritual power being unleashed when the saints sing, am I talking about the power to remember, but I'm also talking about uh, singing has the power to integrate us. Here's, here's, here's been my experience uh, as a pastor. There, there are some of you um, and, and I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm trying to help, okay? Uh, there are some of you that are real rigid and you need rigid things, like you need it. Like you came out of the womb type A, you came out of the womb needing order, and man, you hate that we sing as much as we do. Like you're like, hey, preach the book, man. What is all of this? Why are we doing four songs this week? Preach the book, brother, that's why I'm here. You better exegete that text. I didn't come here to sing that thing six times in a row. I want the book. And then there are some of you that are like, why do you preach so long? What we need to do is just marinate in the presence of God in song. You preach too long. Cut that sermon back to 25 and add seven songs. Right? And, and this, is, like, this is a real thing here. Like, some of you are just like, we sing way, way too much. And others would be like, are you kidding me? Chandler needs to shut up and let us enjoy the Lord. And, and yet, what singing is meant to do is integrate the head and the heart. Look at me, I'm not talking about emotional for emotional sake. That's called emotionalism. That's not what we're after. What we're after is a heart moved by what is true. The integration of head and heart, wooing us out of what we know to be true into an experience of that truth. This is what C.S. Lewis said praise was. Praise was understanding what is true and then expressing it in praise. Well, how do we express it? Through song, right? And then let me read this text, and I think we need to talk about it. This is Colossians 3, 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. I, I love that. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So, so I love that whole thing. Let it dwell in you. Let it, let it let's steep in the word together. Like how many of you have read the Bible in the morning and forgot what you read at lunch? You don't need to raise your hand. I, everyone. 
All right, and so what he's saying here is, no, 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 hey, don't just read it like you're reading a blog or the newspaper. Let it dwell in you richly. Think about it. Meditate upon it. Apply it. Let it dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing, encouraging, edifying, speaking life into building up, and at times rebuking one another in all wisdom. And then listen, it seems like it's making a turn, but it's not making a turn singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Be men and women who have steeped in the word of Christ so that it's in you, right? It's not, you don't just know it, like it's in your guts. And, and then teach and admonish and encourage and then with thankful hearts, sing and sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs. So, so let me try to break some of this down, some things that I think we need to know. Number one, lyrics matter. Lyrics matter. Gordon Fee says this, show me a church's songs and I'll show you their theology. You will not sing my sermon later this week. You're not gonna be in your car and, and just start singing a sentence from my sermon. You will more than likely sing a line from some of the songs that we sing here. People with Alzheimer's and dementia, they don't come back when you play a podcast for them. Right? It's not like they're listening on the iPad and I say, are you tracking with me? And all of a sudden they're back. It's not how this works. Right? It's music that has this power. It's singing that, that has this. And so singing is about this integration. So here, here's what I want to talk about when we're talking about lyrics. Because I think they're, I think again, along these lines of, of being really rigid, and there's not, that's not always a bad thing to be really rigid or just not rigid at all. There can be these two great errors when it comes to the things we sing. There's ways of, of, of walking that aren't helpful. So I, now I wrote this down. There, there's got to be room for poetic license in singing. Right? Like when, when David says, as the deer pants for the water, nobody's there going, you're not a deer. Are you kidding me? David, you make me sick. You don't know anything about your state. You are a human. Don't compare yourself with a deer. You've been made in the image of God. There's got to be some room for poetic license. And this is where we're going to disagree at times because some people feel more comfortable with more poetic license and other people feel less comfortable. And, and this is where we need to be gracious to one another, right? But there's also another way we can err, and that's the, the air uh, of um, not caring at all what the words are and believing that just because it's a good melody that the words don't matter. So you got people that are trying to proof text songs, right? Take one word, one phrase, rip it out of the song and go, it's heretical, which by the way is a really bold word. Like there's certain criteria that have to be met for something to be heretical. We just throw that as we disagree, right? And so the, the two great errors are proof texting songs, not reading the whole song, pulling a phrase out and going, this is, this is incorrect. No, it can be incomplete without being incorrect, right? And then there, the other side of things, they're like, it's just, it, I mean, people love to sing this song. You just shouldn't care about these things, right? No, no, our lyrics matter. Now, what God is after is men and women who sing passionately because what is true and emotively they express that in song for the good of their own souls and the good of the corporate gathering, right? Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read this quote by John Wesley just because I love it. I don't know that it fits neatly in here, but I just thought I'm using this quote at some point this week. John Wesley and his brother wrote 6,500 hymns. I sent that to Bleeker this week and I was like, bro, <laughs> these brothers wrote 6,500 songs. Where are you at? <laughs> right? Uh, but here's, I love the way Wesley puts this. Sing lustily. I just love that. I could have just read that. And with good courage, beware of singing as if you were half dead or half asleep, but lift up your voice with strength. Be no more afraid of your voice now, nor more ashamed of it being heard than when you sung the songs of Satan. Like, John, man. We like Coldplay, bro. So, so here's, here's, what, here's Wesley's argument, right? He's confronting this reality that there are certain venues in which we are not ashamed of our voice. And we sing with a great deal of umph. And he says, hey, don't, 
Don't give God your second best. Don't, don't give Chris Stapleton. Don't, don't give Coldplay. Don't give whoever you're into. Don't give them your primary passion field angst and give God this quiet, me, me, great. Wesley's like, don't do that. With the same zeal that you sing the songs of Satan, which I, it's just such a strange little songs of Satan. The same zeal that you do that, sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord, right? So there's this power unleashed when we sing to remember, to be confronted or comforted. And then there's this power to integrate the head and the heart. And I left the last one because I think it's going to be the most difficult for us um, to, to, to the last part of the sermon so that, that, so that you won't not hear everything I said at first. Right? Here's the third thing. That singing unleashes the power of God over demonic oppression. So let's chat about that. This is a category that I think most modern evangelicals in the West have no, they they just have not looked into it. They have not. I'll tell you what sparked my interest in this sentence that I just said. Um, When we baptize, our baptistry is right there under the stage. When we baptize, here's a testimony we hear every time we baptize on a weekend. Someone will get in the water and here will be their testimony. That when I pulled into the parking lot, I just got a weird sense that I was home. And then when I walked into it and we began to sing, I, I'd been battling depression, I'd been battling anxiety, I'd been walking in this fog. And as we sang, those things began to lift off of me. And there's still a struggle, but they lifted off in a way that I was able to enter in with joy. I was able to listen for the first time to a sermon. I was able to find peace in my heart as we sang to the Lord. And so hearing that testimony once a quarter for 15 years, kind of activated in my heart and mind, seeing things in the scripture that were always there, but I just didn't see them because I grew up as a good white Southern Baptist in Texas. That singing has the power to loosen up demonic oppression. So why do we suffer? Why do we lack victorious living? Well, sometimes we just live in a fallen world, right? The world is broken. Some hardship exists because the world is broken and the Spirit of God sustains us in that world. Sometimes we suffer because we've sinned against God or someone else has sinned against God. You do reap what you sow. Like I'm standing on the stage today as a 43-year-old man who didn't just spontaneously combust onto the stage. I am the result of 20-something years of decisions about whether or not I'm going to submit to Christ, submit to the Word of God, or rebel against it and be my own God. And I can just testify to you that in those moments where I have chosen not to follow the Lord, there's almost always collateral damage. So sometimes suffering is that we have sinned or other people have sinned against us. And then there's this third category that nobody really wants to talk about because it's weird. And, and that's this category that sometimes we're suffering because of demonic oppression. And, and I know you're like, well, I need a verse. And I love you for needing a verse, so let me give it to you. For Samuel 16, starting in verse 14, says this. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. That, that should lead you into all kinds of study. And Saul's servant said to him, Behold, now a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the liar. And when the harmful spirit from God is upon you, he will play it and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, Provide for me a man who can play well and bring him to me. And one of the young men answered, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful and plain. He is a man of valor, a man of war. He is prudent in speech. He is a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. I pray that over my son. I, I want those things for my boy. Therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me David, your son, who is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey laden with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat and sent them by David, his son, to Saul. And David came to Saul and entered his service. And Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David remain in my service, for he has found favor in my sight." 
And whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hands. So Saul was refreshed and well, and the harmful spirit departed him. Now, this is one of many. We could look at the battle of Jericho. Who leads the assault on Jericho? Wasn't it the band? Like, if you're thinking, hey, these walls cannot be conquered. What are we going to do? We don't have any weapons. I know. Send the choir. <laughs> you ever read 2 Chronicles 20? I know that's, for many of you, it's your favorite passage in the Bible where you've got Jehoshaphat who's bowed down before the Lord and going, we're not going to survive this next assault from the Amorites. What are we going to do? And what does God say? Hey, get up and send out the Kohathites before you who were the people that David had instituted in 1 Chronicles 6 to be the singers and the worshipers of God to surround the ark. Right? So God's path to victory is song over demonic principalities and powers. It's a strange thing. And yet, when I think about the seasons of my life that I've walked in, the greatest joy and greatest freedom from my own bents and iniquities, those seasons are marked by consistently gathering with brothers and sisters and singing and then moving on into praying. Um, When I became a, a Christian, at this kind of turning point of what was going on. Um, the, the, the crew that I fell in, there was a group of Assembly of God kids and a group of uh, Church of Christ kids uh, and then three or four of us Baptist kids. And one of the things that we would do, man, is we would get together. Not, I mean, just there was a lot of joyful noise that probably would have sounded like something else outside of the room. And man, we, we, we didn't play instruments. We didn't, so we would get uh, CDs. Um, I don't know if you, you should Google that. They were awesome. Um, and we would get CDs and we would just play a CD and we would sing along with it. And I, I referenced earlier Dennis Jernigan because he had, he had that song, You Are My All in All. And, and then we would play that CD and we would sing terribly at the top of our lungs. And then we would pray together. And then we would walk in obedience. And that was outside of church. Not even, it was across church lines. I think the Church of Christ kids thought we were sinning the whole time. They're like, are those instruments? This is not okay. The Assembly of God kids thought the Baptist kids weren't saved because we weren't speaking in tongues. I mean, it was just this kind of weird group of we're singing, we're loving the Lord, and then we're walking in faith. And, and to this day, I think those seasons of my life where I'm walking in the greatest victory, singing to the Lord with brothers and sisters are a part of not just the weekly gathering, but my life outside of the gathering. Now, the English language, specifically what Americans have done to the English language, and I'm saying that because Steve Temis, our CEO of Acts 29, is from England. He speaks the Queen English. It's a very different language than what we speak. Um, and don't be offended by that. He arrived last night and he said, uh, Matthew, I've arrived and I have a sconced to the hotel. So I had to like look that up. What does a sconced mean? Oh, he's at the hotel. And then I just say, hey, great usage of the word ensconced. And I had to look it up. Right, And so there's this, like the English language, specifically what we have done with it, is we have created an immense amount of junk drawer words. right? And so the, the burden is on the here to figure out what in the world we're talking about. Right? Like if, you, if something's cool, you could be referencing the temperature or the swagger of something. You know, you've got to hear it in context and then make the decision. Right? Don't get me started on the word love. Gosh, what don't we love in 2018? We're not saying the same thing, I hope. Tacos, fajitas, Instagram, our new phone, our wife, our children, our car, work, church, house, love. <laughs> now, it's junk drawer. The, the Hebrews and Greeks, they, they didn't operate like this. They, they didn't have junk. They were, they were nuanced about what exactly they were talking about. Um, both the Greeks and Hebrews had a ton of different words for love, and they had a ton of different words for praise or singing or what it meant to do this thing that we're talking about. And so what I wanted to do today is end by just kind of looking at the seven primary Hebrew words for praise. And then what we're going to do is we're going to practice, right? Let, let me walk through this. Here, here's the first um, Hebrew word for praise, halal. Here's what halal means, to boast foolishly and make a show of it. Now, if you are like me, I I was saved at a Southern Baptist church, primarily Anglo, in the South, and this is forbidden, but you dare make a show of anything. This ain't about you, it's about the Lord. You sit down and you be quiet. You nod, maybe, but don't nod too much. That's too charismatic for us. 
right? Like I'm serious. I, I became a Christian where explicitly and implicitly the lesson taught was calm down. You just calm down about the Lord. You are way too out of control. You will outgrow this stage of zeal. Like, I mean, seriously, I'm First Baptist Church of Texas. If someone said amen. It was a huge distraction to the entire body. Amen. Who was that? Somebody brought their crazy aunt from the backwoods of Missouri. <laughs> and man, if someone raised their hands, I mean, a deacon might get involved. Did you need something? You don't need anything? You good? Okay. <laughs> But you've got this word halal that basically means, hey, to boast, to act foolishly, to make a show of it. I think the place that you see this most viscerally is when David, in the book of Samuel, where David is leading the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem, right? The presence of God has returned among his people, and David just gets caught up, and he strips out his outer garments, and he's singing, and he's dancing, just rejoicing, because the presence of God is back. And then he gets home, he's all sweaty, you know, sweated through his ephod. And his wife, Michael, was like, are you pleased with yourself? You pleased with yourself? You made a real fool of yourself. And you remember David's response? Woman, I'll become even more undignified than this. It was for the Lord that I was boasting. It's not boasting for people to see. I don't care about how you perceive me. If I'm a fool, I'm a fool in my enjoyment of God. Right? This is halal. And look at me. You have this gear. You have this gear. Philadelphia Eagle fans, you got this gear. Houston Astros fans, you got this gear. Cubs fans, good Lord, do you guys have this gear? I was like, it's been a billion years, yes! I mean, I thought, I thought like Philly and Chicago would be burned to the ground. That's halal. Losing your mind over what? Right? This is hello, and we've got the gear. We've just been taught explicitly and implicitly that God doesn't want this gear. Like God is going, yeah, I'm not that big. Calm down, everybody. And I am not that big of a deal. Like I just saw what Philly did. That was epic. I get it. I don't want that on me. That is far more glorious than anything I've done, you know, like creating and managing the known universe and saving you from sin and death forever. But that right there, that's amazing. Oh my gosh, Sports Illustrated prophesied the year before that they would win that? I mean, I haven't done anything like that. That's amazing. Yeah, hello. Right, we've got this gear. We've just been implicitly and explicitly taught that God doesn't want this. We're wrong. The second Hebrew word, tehillah, it means to praise vocally in song or shouts. And then zamar is to praise with instruments alone or with voices. And then this is the one I think you'll be most familiar with, hallelujah. And hallelujah, here's the way to think about hallelujah. It's a shouting call for corporate praise. So, so it's someone who's leading, crying out hallelujah to get you to enter in. Whenever I read this word, I think, and, and don't boo or hiss or whoop or whatever it is you do, I always think of uh, Texas A&M, and, and here's why. Um, if you ever go to an Aggie game at Kyle Field, they don't have cheerleaders, they have what they call yell leaders. All right, and they're wearing these whites, so they look like milkmen, all right? Uh, and, and here's at least what historically has been known as milkmen. And here's what I have 105,000 people are watching what's supposed to be a, a good game, and they're hopeful, and it's not going well, and they're not sure what's going to happen. And then these milkmen, they do something, right? They, they make some hand gestures, they. And at, as soon as they do that, 105,000 people, laser-like focus, and then they all chant together, willing their team by the love of Christ to win. <laughs> right? This is hallelujah. This is the milkman saying, we need you. Get in here. Be involved in this. This is hallelujah. Hallelujah. A corporate cry or a cry for corporate response. And for you Star Wars nerds, there's yada. This is to lift. I'm sorry, I don't know why I do stuff like that. It's me. It's brokenness in me. I'm sorry. It's to lift or throw arms upward in praise and surrender. I don't have time for all of this, but let's chat. You are an embodied soul. You get that? We're not Gnostics. You are an embodied soul. The reason God says, lift your hands, bow down, shout, dance, clap. It goes, it goes back to integration, right? The head and the heart becoming more and more and that gap closing. 
So we don't lift up our hands, again, because God has low self-esteem. He just really needs to be encouraged after this tough week. No, we lift our hands because something happens in us when we lift our hands. We clap not because God needs applause. We clap because we want our spirits and minds and hearts integrating in such a way that we become the kind of worshiper that God would want us to be for our joy and his glory. This isn't about showmanship. You can clap, shout, lift your hands, dance around like a fool and be far from God and just making, making a show of it. None of those kind of movements makes you a mature Christian. We don't get to judge spiritual maturity by someone's external actions, but by the kindness of their heart and their love for the Lord in everyday normalcy, not just in how they sing and raise their hands. You with me? Um, then there's Toda, which to sing praises together as one community in harmony. Now, um, my guess, if you've ever been to a concert, this is my experience at every concert I've ever been to. You, usually th there's this one song that makes a, a band explode onto the scene, right? Uh, and that's the big hit. And everybody at the, con the concert's waiting for that big hit to be played. So whoever you love, whatever that song is that you love, that everybody else loves about that artist, you're just kind of waiting. They, they never open with it, right? They sometimes like in the concert, everybody's like, come on, man, do we have to do this? Just get back out here and sing your hit. And then they come out, and every 100% of the time, they will start that song, begin to sing it, get to the chorus, and then what do they do? They bow out, and they let the, the crowd sing it. And there's an energy and a force of unity that occurs when all of those voices mingle into one sound. This is what's happening in this word, Toda that as we hear one another's voices, we are encouraged and built up in love. We remember that we are not alone. We remember that for however crummy or however awesome our week was, we belong to something bigger. It's subtle, it's subversive, and it reminds the soul. That's why it's important that we hear each other's voices. It's although we have permission to worship and praise loudly, that's what the text said in 150, don't email me, all right? Loud symbols even. Right? That the primary thing we want to hear is each other and our voices filling the room. It does something to us. And then uh, lastly, sabbath, which is to reach out with affection for God, to feel his hold on us. So here's what I was thinking. I thought, wouldn't it be terrible if we taught on all of this and then didn't practice it at all? So we flipped the clock. I don't know if you noticed this, but we normally have a 25-minute clock up front, and it was just 15 minutes. So that for the next 15, we could actually try this. And, and so I, I think you, you just got to prepare yourself that, that the dude behind you might have heard a little bit better than you did, and you might just, you're about to get something bouncing off the back of your head that might be distracting, or good Lord, that dude needs lessons. Um, but what I, what I want us to do is try the best we can, not, not to muster anything, but to give ourselves over to the 50 commands in the Bible to sing for our own good, for the good of our body, and for the glory of God. And I want us in the weeks to come to grow in this, that we might be known as a church that expresses its love to the Lord boastfully and loudly in song, even if it's a bit off tune. Right? And so I'm simply going to pray for us. And like I said, we're going to sing for 15 minutes. And then here at this campus, I'm going to come back out uh, and I'll close this with communion. Uh, and then uh, I'll just pray that, that singing becomes more a part of your life, in your car, with your family, at the house, over your children, over the, that song might become an atmosphere that you create in your own homes, right? Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you for these men and women. I thank you for the gift of song. Thank you for how it builds up our hearts. Thank you for how it encourages us. Thank you for how it even uh, emboldens us to pray. I pray even now as we enter into 15 minutes of singing to you about how you're the cornerstone, how you never let us down and you never will let us down as we sing about the greatness of your faithfulness, that we not feel like we need to muster anything or um, perform for anyone, but that you would just incite our hearts with what's true about what we're singing. And will you usher us into greater freedom than maybe historically we have? I think that we're not talking about singing today as much as we're talking about power 
we're talking about singing as much as we're talking about the power of victorious Christian living, at least one of the tools that you've given us? And I ask that where there are barriers of being too cool or barriers of man, not liking our voice or barriers to not really um, being built that way, that we'd be able to surrender to your commands like we would any of your other commands. Help us. It's for your beautiful name I pray. Amen.